Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is a delight to be here with you. You are a truly delightful human being, as I've discovered in the last five minutes. What, <laughs> <laughs> what a glorious thing to say. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hooray, I'm so glad to be here with all of you. It's terrific. Yeah. Um, I wanted to start, before we um, get into the book, um, just congratulating you on your beloved Red Sox and their <laughs> sweep of the World Series. Um, I realize that might be a controversial thing to say, given that there are many Cubs fans in the room, and we haven't quite been able to replicate what the Red Sox have since There's that. still time in this 21st century. <laughs> you know, it was an odd World Series for me because my first love was the Brooklyn Dodgers, and then my enduring love, 35 years of season tickets, was the Red Sox. And so my father had taught me that wonderful, mysterious art of keeping score while listening to baseball games when I was six, and that's where the love of history came from, and he really made me think there was nothing more important than the Brooklyn Dodgers, but then they got taken away from us, and so I felt such resentment over all these years, and then somehow when this World Series came again, I just started thinking, maybe I should be more like Abraham Lincoln and just feel good for the Dodgers and not be mad at them anymore. So I was really praying that the series would go to seven games so that the fans in, in Los Angeles could know what we've known and what you guys have known here, that glory of being in a World Series. And so I actually was sad. I would never tell my friends who are equally as passionate as I am about the Red Sox, as long as they would have won in the seventh game, that the Red Sox would have won. But anyway, we all know that when we won in 04, the whole city of Boston was rooting that the next year would be the Cubs, because we'd been twinned forever as these everlasting teams that everybody loved so passionately and never won. And now we've both won, and there's lots of time left in the 20. We've won four, so you, you've got to catch up to us pretty soon. <laughs> I love the sport of baseball. It's yeah. transported from generation to generation. There are times when I can go to the games now. My parents died long before my kids were born, and I can sit there with my boys and imagine myself back at Ebbets Field with my father, watching Jackie Robinson, Pee Wee Reese, Duke Snyder. You know, and then I look over and I see my sons in the place. They've become equally irrational fans in the place where my <laughs> father sat. And I can feel this invisible loyalty linking my sons to the grandfather whose face they never saw. but whose heart and soul they have come to know through all the stories I have told. So I think that's why baseball captures our hearts and minds. It's passed down through families, and yeah. it's a community experience, and we're lucky to have it in this town as passionate as Boston is in ours. Yes. Um, I was thinking about baseball when I was reading this book because, you know, baseball is one of those sports where it can kind of stretch out and it feels like nothing's really happening and then all of a sudden explodes into action. And even though, you know, this is a book about very troubling times in our nation's history, it is like reading an action history. I mean, this is your government at work. There's so much happening. There's so much that gets done over the course of these four presidencies, you know, from the the voting, um, the Civil Rights Act, to the Voting Rights Bill, to the Emancipation Proclamation, the end of slavery, the GI Bill, so many incredible things happen. So, um, and I wanna talk more about government, but I wanted to start, since you know we are the Humanities Festival and we do gather together and kind of think about things, to have you talk about how you would characterize these four presidents, um, FDR, well, Abraham Lincoln, FDR, Teddy Roosevelt, and um, LBJ, uh, Lyndon Johnson, as thinkers um, and, and their own connection to the humanities, because it struck me reading this that they are very interesting in that sense in how the humanities link to them. And so how would you characterize you know, that their passion for reading, for writing, the way they were all great storytellers. How did that round out their character and contribute to their leadership? Oh, I think there's no question that there's just a direct connection between the humanities, reading, books, plays, literature, and each one of my guys in many ways. I mean, think about Abraham Lincoln. He only had 11 months of full schooling, so he had to scour the countryside for books, and it was said that he read everything he could lay his hands on. He was so excited when he got something of Shakespeare or one of Aesop's fables, that he couldn't sleep, he couldn't eat. And there's that sense in which books transported him to another world. He could imagine that maybe someday 
He wouldn't be shucking corn or splitting rails. His father didn't like the idea that he loved reading so much he thought he was useless on the farm, would take books away from him when he was reading in the middle of plowing. But they allowed him, I think, to begin to think that he could become something different. And there's no question, I think, that his gift for language, which may have been inborn, was developed through reading the great literature, and that poetry and drama gave him solace. I mean, even during the presidency, he went to the theater a 100 times. Somehow he felt that if he could just watch something about human nature and Shakespeare, he could forget the war that was raging or learn from what he was learning in literature. Teddy Roosevelt, too, because he was so asthmatic as a child, um, he was pretty much of an invalid, and he just read books all the time, so much so that the father worried that he was becoming too bookish and needed to rebuild his body. But he said that somehow when he read books about adventurous people like explorers and, and, and deer slayers, he could imagine himself with a strong body instead of this timid kid. And then when he got to be president, he talked about the fact that leaders need more than anything to understand human nature. And the best way to understand human nature is through reading the great works of poetry or prose or literature. So for each of those two men, I think books were central to their being. They were re reading all the time during the presidency. Teddy one time was said that he read during the summer when he was in the middle of this coal strike, he read all nine volumes of the new biography then on Nicolay and Hay on Abraham Lincoln. And he just, he would read while he was waiting for his wife to come down from the dinner. He was reading in between vi visitors coming to the White House. Franklin Roosevelt is different. I mean, he, was, he had an almost photographic memory for everything he had read, and he read a lot when he was young. But mostly he learned through a whole series of problem-solving techniques. For example, he got interested in stamps. He was a collector from the time he was little. I think in the lonely world that he lived in, collecting gave him a mastery over whatever he was doing. But when he collected a stamp, he would look at the issuing country from which the stamp had come, and then he would read all the history of that country, and then he'd read the encyclopedia about the route that the stamp had took from there to wherever it came from. Or similarly, he collected maps, and the same thing occurred, that he used one thing to learn about a lot of other things. And how lucky we were that this leader who would become in World War II, somebody who needed to know geography, needed to know maps. In fact, one of his famous speeches, he asked everybody to get a map in 1942 so they could see where the war was battling, because they couldn't picture what was happening in the Pacific. And um, there was wonderful, the guy who ran C.S. Hammond's map store said he had had more requests for maps that week than he had in an entire year. And in fact, then he said, even my wife of 50 years, who hates maps, asked me to bring a map home. <laughs> then I started thinking, what kind of a marriage did they have anyway if he's hated me? Then I said, stop thinking about this. You wonder why your books take so long? <laughs> so at any rate, LBJ is somewhat of an outlier. When he was a little kid, he read, he learned the alphabet. When he was three, he used to recite poetry to please his mother when he was four. But at a certain period of time, he just asked, once he got interested in politics, um, is it real? I only want to read about it if it's real. And so he didn't really read all that much when he got older. He's, he, you're right ahead. that he said he thought through conversation. That's which I exactly like. right. He read people. And that's another way to read. He understood instinctively what a person wanted or needed. Um, he could meet a senator and know this senator wants to go to Europe. This senator wants to be on a presidential commission. Or, you know, Everett Dirksen, when he was talking to him, he knows that he wants to somehow trade all sorts of things so that Illinois would be filled with all sorts of postmasterships and ambassadorships. But he also knew that Everett Dirksen cared about being remembered, as some of the great men in history did. So he says to him, Everett, if you come with me on the civil rights bill and you bring some Republicans to break the Democratic filibuster, 200 years from now, school children will know only two names, Abraham Lincoln and Everett Dirksen. <laughs> But the funny thing about him is that he had a massive heart attack in the 1950s, and so they decided to write an article that he had changed his whole being as a result, and he was going to be much more reflective and think more and relax more. So they painted a picture of him lying in a hammock at the ranch, reading Plato and Aristotle, with Strauss coming in over the loudspeaker. <laughs> of course, it wasn't true, but it allowed him to think, this is the person I might have been. Right. Anyway, books, reading, and 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 literature absolutely a part in forming all of them, as it is for all of us. And it's so important for us to keep fighting for the humanities in the midst of colleges that are reducing them more and more and more. Yeah. Yes. Um, th th this leads that kind of aspirational quality that they all shared, wanting to become a kind of 
a certain kind of man. I mean, we've been talking a lot about temperament and what is the right temperament for a president or a Supreme Court justice. And this book has lots to say about temperament. But none of these men were necessarily born with a presidential temperament. They had to discover that through trial and error. And in many, Johnson may not have ever really fully discovered it. You know, <laughs> I, um, can you talk about that? That this is something they, they weren't born, they had to acquire. Oh, without a question. I mean, I think the reason I started the book when they run for office for the first time is that I was in a college campus and I was talking about leadership lessons from the White House, from the Roosevelt's, and a student raised his hand and said, how can I ever become one of them? They're already on Mount Rushmore. They're on the currency. They're in movies. I need to feel that I'm watching their journey. So I, they each, I start when they each run, as I say. Lincoln was 23 years old. He's the only one that I do think had the temperament, not necessarily of a president, but of a leader and an extraordinary man from the time he was young. That very first statement he makes when he runs, he says, every man has his peculiar ambition. Mine is to be esteemed of by my fellow man, to be worthy of that esteem. That's a, a larger ambition than for self, which the other ones all had when they started. It was for doing something that would stand the test of time. But then he says, I know that you don't know me very well. I have no popular relations to recommend me. I probably, you won't vote for me, and I won't be too much disappointed because I'm familiar with disappointment. But then he says, however, if I lose, I'm going to try five or six times until it's so humiliating that I promise I will never try again. <laughs> so it's amazing. So he has that perseverance yeah. that's such an important part of temperament. When Teddy goes in at 23, he says, I'm not really going in to help people. Somebody said to him, why not run for the state legislature? I just thought it might be an adventure to be there. But then once he got there and he began to see parts of the world that he'd never seen before, tenements, child factories, um, police commissioners wandering the streets at night, he begins to see that the conditions of life for other people are very different from his insulated world. And he develops a certain kind of empathy that he hadn't felt before, and he acknowledges that. I, I needed fellow feeling. This, that idea of an encounter with poverty or hardship or people who are marginalized, not fully part of the American dream, is something that marked all four of them, right? I mean, LBJ and um, Lincoln experienced that firsthand in their personal lives. but. FDR and Teddy Roosevelt had that pivotal encounter. That's exactly right. I mean, I think for FDR, even though he was a natural politician in the sense that once he ran for office, he loved the barnstorming process. He found this is what he wanted to do. He had been much more insulated in his childhood with his mm -hmm. parents. And then he gets out on the road, and he loves listening to people, hearing their stories. But I think what really transported him into a deep-seated empathy and a warm-heartedness toward other people was the polio attack. Because then he created the Warm Springs Rehabilitation Clinic, and he allowed himself to be vulnerable there. And he saw his fellow patients who had lost the sense of purpose in life. They'd lost joy in life. And he taught them that they could be paralyzed and still have wheelchair dances. They could play water polo and tag. They could have cocktail parties at night. And he said he was Doc Roosevelt. He was a spiritual director. He learned that huge fulfillment that comes from making other people feel that their lives are changed. So his ambition became much larger as a result of that experience. So at some point in all their lives, LBJ was really just after power when he was young, even, the, even when he went to college um, before he took a year off, which will be the formative year, which I'll describe in a minute. He just wanted to assume power, so he took a job mopping floors outside the president's office because he figured the president has power, so I'm going to learn from him. And then after a while, he talks so much to the president, he's in the president's office, he's no longer mopping the floors, he's a clerk, and then he's running the president's office, and he's got power. And then when he first goes to Washington as the chief of staff, of a, a, a congressman who had just been elected, he gets to the city, we were talking about this beforehand, he said, oh, power, I can smell it in this city. It's got an odor, you know. <laughs> so then he goes to this congressional secretary's um, hotel where they all live, and he says, I've got to figure out the people who have power among the congressional secretaries. I'm going to get to know them, and they'll teach me. So he goes into the bathroom every morning, every 10 minutes, in order to brush his teeth four different times so he can talk to more people. He takes four different showers at night so he can talk to more people, and he figures out, these are the guys with power. I'm going to latch on to them. 
But then he takes a year off from college, and he goes to this poor Mexican-American school, Catula, and he sees, as he said, the pain of prejudice on these kids' faces, and he wants to do something for them. So he uses his salary to buy sports equipment. He becomes the band leader, the debate coach, the principal of the school, and the oral histories, when you read of those kids, he changed their life because he believed in them. He fired ambition in them. So that's when his desire for somehow doing something for himself got attached to a larger purpose. Once a leader feels that, I think it transforms them. Yeah, and you, I mean, when we think about presidential powers, we may not think about things like empathy or sensitivity, patience, prudence, and these are all things that you use to describe the four different men. Do we have a political system that really encourages those kinds of traits, characteristics? Well, I worry right now that because being in politics, at least in these last you know, decade or so, um, for many people in the Congress, you don't feel that sense of fulfillment that you've bipartisan got legislation through that's changing the face of the country the way people would have felt in the 60s in that extraordinary time when you could wake up knowing that a voting rights bill had passed, as you said at the start, or a civil rights bill, or Medicare, or aid to education, or NPR, or PBS, and you know that something's, your children will remember what you did, so that produced more people wanting to go into public life. But I think the combination now of the, the complete paralysis in Washington, of the need for raising money and spending four hours every day raising money for the stupid campaigns where you're spending money on your ads, which are negative ads against other people, where that poison in the system is the money in our system, and we have to do something about it. Plus the private lives being exposed by the media in a way they weren't. I worry whether or not the people that are now going in um, before, maybe this year will be different. Maybe there's lots of young people now. There's lots of women, more record-breaking women than ever before. People who'd never been in politics before, teachers and doctors getting into politics. Maybe there's, that's the hope of what's, what the terrible turmoil we're living through now, that they'll be coming in not just to assume power, which is that selfish ambition, but to want to change the nature of our culture. Yeah, and well, or change the nature of government. I mean, I think... <laughs> stepped on your line. Um, you know, these are... These four men, in different ways, had great capacity, it speaks to their intellectual capacities we were talking about earlier, to understand systems. Um, and then all of them, even though you know FDR was a critic of government, he said it was cumbersome when you're trying to solve complex problems, and LBJ said of, you know, led the legislative system that it didn't really produce fresh and novel ideas um, or innovative ideas. But all four of them were able to look at government and put it to work and all the accomplishments that you just outlined um, and find ways to do that. And that seems to me a very different attitude, a real belief in government. And so in some ways this book is as much about, it's about these four presidents, but it's about government. I, I think that's really true. I'm not even sure I thought about that fully, but I think all of them came into office in, in terrible times of turmoil, I mean, worse than ours. I mean, I think it helps us to remind ourselves of what it was like when Lincoln took office and the country had split in two and a war was gonna take place that would kill more than 600,000 people. And yet, because he was there and because he knew that the war had to have a purpose and the Union government had to be mobilized to fight that war, and eventually he comes up with the idea that the war will not just simply be for bringing the Union back together, but for emancipating the slaves. There was something permanent that came out of the government, came out of his executive order, came out of his leadership that changed the country forever, that enduring sin of slavery being gone. Teddy Roosevelt comes in at a time of laissez-faire when the Industrial Revolution has shaken up the economy in ways very similar in some ways to the tech revolution and globalization today. There's a huge gap between the rich and the poor. Um, the working class is, is really in terrible straits, and there's a lot of bombings in the streets. There's nationwide strikes. There's a lot of anxiety in the country. And he realizes that he needs to use the force of government to soften some of the worst aspects of the industrial order, to break up the big monopolies, to regulate the railroads, the corruption that was going on. And he decided that he was a steward of the people, that it wasn't just labor or management. He had something bigger, and the government was his engine. And certainly for FDR, the New Deal swelled the government, but was absolutely essential to get us through the Depression and through World War II, obviously. 
Yeah, and, and so I wonder if, to do that, when you were talking about Teddy Roosevelt, it's a fascinating history and a really compelling story about what he did and how he figured that out to say he was acting in the public interest. But you could look at all four as having expanded the power of the executive. And you know we're in a moment right now where we're wrestling with that, right? What is the relationship among the branches of government? Does the executive have too much power? Is that something that even presidents as different as, as President Trump and, and President Barack Obama um, both did? And I wonder how you, if you could speak to that, how they're connected to that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. I mean, in each one of these cases, the powers of government, federal government, had to be expanded. I mean, there was no way you could win the war without doing that in the Civil War. During the New Deal, it was absolutely essential that the private sector and local government and state government couldn't handle the depth of depression, so FDR had to use the federal government to create jobs, something that is never done before. But at and, and the same time, Lyndon Johnson understood that until the federal government could deal with voting rights and desegregation, the states were not going to be able to do it. But it does then leave a legacy. But I think what's different then than now is that each one of those understood if they were going to expand the powers of the government, they had to have a relationship with the American people. And they had to create a bond with them so that they would be the people who wanted to have this happen. I mean, you think about what Lincoln was able to do through his gift for language. Those speeches transformed the attitude of the American people who simply, at the first, wanted to, most of them, fight the war just to save the Union, not to emancipate the slaves. Teddy Roosevelt made government an actor, but the people supported that because he explained this is a square deal for the rich and the poor, the capitalist and the wage worker. And probably most importantly, FDR, through his fireside chats, was able to have a continuing conversation with the people. This is why we have to deal with the problems of the banking system. This is why we need the Tennessee Valley Authority. This is why we have to create jobs. And he made everybody feel he was talking to them individually, that they were in his mind when he gave those fireside chats. There's an extraordinary story about Saul Bellow here in Chicago saying when one of those fireside chats was on the radio, you could walk down the street and you could see everybody looking at their radios and you could watch them in their living rooms and their kitchens. You could hear his voice coming out. You could keep walking down the street and not miss a word of what he was saying because everybody was listening. And then there's a story of a construction worker running home one night and his partner said, where are you going? He said, well, my president's coming to speak to me in my living room. It's only right I be there to greet him when he comes. So what made it different was that the people were an active participant in wanting the government to do those deeds. And they were part of it all. They, the anti-slavery movement was part of what gave Abraham Lincoln his power. The progressive movement had already developed in the settlement houses and in the social gospel and the churches before Teddy Roosevelt assumed the power of government to deal with these problems. And of course, the civil rights movement was already there that, that, that LBJ was able to depend upon to use the government to do what had to be done that the states and local governments couldn't. But it does leave each power that's gained seems to stay there. And then it leads to a situation, if you do have a leader that doesn't have the bond with all those people and is using that power in a way that may not be legal, that may not be what the general majority of the people want, and then you have to have a check and balance in the system. So there, there's a problem with it, but I still would take my guys doing what they did, given the problems they faced, and dealing with the problems in a way, only way it could be dealt with at the time. The, that leads to a question that I've been pondering. You know, your work, this book, and all your other works um, have been exceptional in allowing us into the minds and motivations of presidents, people that we might not otherwise have access to. Um, and that's a fantastic gift to all of us. But I, as you say, some of these movements were in place and then these presidents were able to come in and kind of move, move their, their goals or where they were headed forward. But do we, do we give too much credit to presidents? I mean, is there a limit um, in terms of thinking about their significance in our history? Oh, I, I think without a question we do. I mean, Lincoln would say when somebody said, you're the liberator, he said, no, the anti-slavery people and the Union soldiers did it all. And I think it's important for us looking back at history because it will make us feel 
strengthened as citizens. If we just think of these, especially now, mostly white men until Barack Obama, I think it's a very good thing that in colleges and high schools now, we're looking at movements, the women's movement, the environmental movement, the gay rights movement. All of these movements came from the citizens, and right now it's so important for us as citizens to realize, given the atmosphere in which we're living right now, that it's not just a matter of waiting for some other leader to come around, that we have to take the actions. Our political system, as I say, it needs absolute revolution, almost ref reformation. There's something not healthy about it, even before Mr. Trump came in. And there are answers to it, as FDR said, you know, problems created by man can be solved by man. We can work on getting the money out of the system. We can have congressional districts by nonpartisan commissions. We can have, as I still believe so strongly, in some national service system that will allow people at home and they come out of college to work for a year or two in another part of the country so they don't see in the rural areas the people in the city as the others or the people in the city see the rural people as the others. That's what Teddy Roosevelt warned, that that's when the rock of democracy would founder, when people in different regions or parties see each other as the other rather than as common American citizens. And we have to hope it's not going to take a national crisis abroad, but somehow a, a ginning up of that national sense of working together on a common problem at home. So there are answers to this if we believe that it's the citizens, and that's why your question is so important, I think. Um, <laughs> There's also the question, um, you know, the, the book, as you said, it, it, it's their formative years, it's this sort of crucible experience, as you call it, when they're, they face some kind of challenge, personal, professional, or both. Um, their early days in office and sort of what they accomplish and how they lay out their plan. Uh, and then their, their deaths, sort of the aftermath of, of being a president or the demise of, of that role. Um, and I was struck by one of the stories you tell about Johnson um, in speaking of the importance of presidents, but he signed um, Medicare. He wanted to travel to Harry Truman's hometown to do it because Truman was the president who was really powerfully connected to this idea, and so he wanted to honor him. And everyone said, why do you want to go there? Let's do it in the Capitol. And he said, no, it's really important to honor him, and in fact, Truman, was honored and said he hadn't been honored like that in so long. He was so happy to have yeah. the whole signing ceremony taking place in his hometown, because at that point he had sort of been forgotten. And I guess that's something too, again today, that seems out of joint, that you would hope that the presidents could look to the previous presidents for advice, for solace. Only those presidents know what it's like. You know, when President Obama was in office, he asked me to organize a series of my fellow historians to come and have dinners with him every now and then, to come as our presidents. We didn't dress up like them, but we would bring the ideas of Jefferson or Jackson or Truman or FDR into the dinner party, and then whatever problem he was facing, it would be our guys giving him advice on that problem. And they were wonderful for us, and I hope they were helpful for him. And what makes me sad today is just the feeling that President and Trump feels he has to obliterate everything that took place in the previous administration, rather than just see it as a relay race, as Obama did, where you pass a baton, you do a certain amount, it's unfinished, and the next person can try and finish it. It's just an unhealthy thing not to see them and even, you know, even be able to, to use their understanding and advice in moments of pressure rather than trying to feel that you're in competition with them and you have to let them be lessened so you can be greater. I mean, it brings us to the question of weakness, right? And, and what do we want in a present? Do we want them to be exceptional, greater than us, beyond our reach? Or do we want them to be just like us, you know, humans in all their frailty? And you, you do talk about some of their weaknesses. For example, Teddy Roosevelt, you write a couple of times that he would have left his wife's deathbed to answer the call to battle, um, you know. There are other weaknesses. But no, I mean, surely, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt had a similar desire to be the center of attention that President Trump has in mm -hmm. the sense that they said he wanted to be the baby at the baptism and the bride at the wedding and the corpse at the funeral. <laughs> um, 
I mean, and he, he had this certain charisma, too. When, when somebody wants to be the center of attention, it's almost like it sucks you in when you come into the room. And, um, and, but on the other hand, he used that sense of, of centrality to do something that made things better for the American people. So that made it okay until he couldn't bear the idea of not being president anymore, and he ends up running against his friend Taft because he couldn't stand being in the center of attention. He hurts the very progressive force that he had mobilized. So all, all of them have their weaknesses. I mean, Lyndon Johnson was unable to control his emotions the way that, that Lincoln and FDR could. Lincoln had this great ritual. Whenever he got mad at somebody, he would write a hot letter to the person, and then he would put the letter aside, hoping he would cool down psychologically and never need to send it. So when you go through his papers, there are these raft of blistering letters written to people, and then they would, underneath it said, never sent and never signed. <laughs> um, somehow we don't see that controlling of emotions and impulses very much today. <laughs> I keep wishing that maybe there could be hot tweets that never go anywhere, and they just get put aside, and then he could talk to the people whenever he wanted to. <laughs> you know, the interesting thing is that Lincoln could speak extemporaneously as better than any of his fellow politicians. When he was in those debates with, with Stephen Douglas, um, he could entertain the crowd for hours with little quips about people, but he never wanted to speak extemporaneously when he was president because he knew that words matter, that words can hurt, and that words can take you in the wrong direction, and that you are setting an example for the country. And I think it's something we're living through right now because there's an argument that some people may make, just I don't care what he says as long as he's doing what I hope he can do. And it's some people, even if they're getting a short-term benefit from what's happening with this administration, and understandably, if you're a business person, Person and you've got a corporate tax that's helping, I understand that. But at some point, pe pe people, and especially Republicans who have supported him, have to think of what does it mean as a citizen now to be caring about the country as a whole and not just our own interests, and what is he doing to the words, to the meaning of words, to the toxic environment. It's not just him, it's been there for a while, and, and, and the feeling of the demonization of both parties. But all of my guys understood the power of words. But think about, if we don't think words matter, what do you think about the Gettysburg Address? What do you think about the second inaugural when he's able to talk about reconciling the country from the North and the South? Both sides read the same Bible. Both pray to the same God. Neither's prayers are fully answered. And then words we could so use now, with malice toward none and charity for all, let us bind up the nation's wounds. Or what do you think about words meaning that inaugural address of FDR's was so powerful in giving his contagious optimism to the people that suddenly the mood of the people changed. That's the mystery of leadership, the mystery of words. There's a wonderful letter that was written into FDR saying, I've lost my job, my roof fell off, my wife is mad at me, my dog ran away, but it's okay, you're there and we're gonna be fine. <laughs> so what do you think about the words of Lyndon Johnson in the We Shall Overcome speech? And they inspired the nation and eight weeks later the Voting Rights Act passed. So, so we have to think about what these words meant and we have to think about how we're using words today in this environment because it's really destroying our sense of, of culture and what we are and, and who we are as a people and our identity. I don't mean to be, you know, the only, the only callback I'd say on that, I'm still not pessimistic. I think we're going to get through this. I believe that you have no other choice than to be optimistic, no other choice than to know we got through these terrible times. These people didn't know it was going to end up all right. When you're in the middle of the Civil War, you're in the middle of World War II, you're not to know how that war ended. And they had to live through that terrible anxiety and there was enough backbone in the people that they were able to do it, and they were able to keep working at it, and that's what we have to do today. If they can do it, we can do it. It feels different, though, that in all of their cases, they were leading us somewhere, right? right. I mean, and they had but a... enough about these guys. <laughs> but no, seriously, I mean, I wonder, you know, are we going to have a woman president? Are you going to write her? Um, write about her. <laughs> I'm getting pretty old, so it better happen have. pretty quickly. <laughs> of course we're going to have a woman president someday. Of course we are. We are so far behind every other country. You know, I mean, I, I think about, and we've talked about the fact that one of the things that, that um, Link, that, that, what's his name? Not Lincoln. Um, yes, Lincoln. The team of rivals. That he was able to put various people in his cabinet, which you again wish a leader would do, who could argue and question their assumptions. Well, 
FDR had Eleanor, that's all he needed. As he said, <laughs> she was a welcome thorn in his side. She was always willing to question his assumptions. I mean, she's so great. If any woman could have been president, there's no question it was Eleanor. She, she was able to write so many memos to General Marshall during World War II about discrimination in the Army that he had to assign a separate general whose only task was to deal with Eleanor Roosevelt's memos. <laughs> She was the first first lady to hold weekly press conferences where she made a simple rule that only female reporters could come to her press conferences. So all over the country, stuffy publishers had to hire their first female reporter. The entire generation gets their start by Eleanor Roosevelt. So yes, Eleanor Roosevelt, had she been alive today, could absolutely be president. And there's probably dozens of women out there and they will come through. I think this year, I think it's not just a, a blip that more women are running by huge record-breaking numbers. They just have to populate various parts of our system, and it's got to happen pretty soon. If I'm ever going to write about it, it's probably too, I'll have to wait for my younger historians to do it, but what a happy job that would be. All right, so we asked you to submit questions, and I have some here, and I want to turn to some of those. So the first one, we. You were just talking about the impact of the current president on the overall system, and someone asks, it's anonymous, do you think the framers of the Constitution incorporated sufficient safeguards against a president like the one we have now who doesn't respect truth or the Constitution? Well, it may seem like there's no check and balance to him, but the ultimate check is the American people. And the question will be, do they come out and vote? Do they get active? Do they start arguing about what's happening? Um, that, that still is, you may have power in the Congress, in the court, and in the presidency, but in the end, the American people have more power. I mean, that's one of the things that Lincoln said, with public sentiment, anything is possible. Without it, nothing is possible. So it's up to the people right now, and there is that power latent in the, pre in the people, and they can change the situation. In terms of the current politics, though, do you think the Democrats have to take the House in order for that us to move forward in that way? I mean, I think probably this midterm election is one of the most consequential. I think people are right in saying that in our history. And just to begin the checks and balances because of the fear that if, if Republicans win and the Mueller investigation is stopped in its tracks, then I think there really could be a paralysis in the system. But if that investigation is allowed to go forward and we can figure out what happened, um, and there is a check on some of the actions. And then I think we, we've got another election coming up in 2020, and there'll be time to deal with that. If it doesn't happen now, I worry about where the country's going. But, the, but I, I think it's not going to happen I, for some reason. Again, this may be the optimism I was bred as. I think you're either born optimistic or not. And somehow, I was lucky enough to have parents that exuded in me that sense that things would be all right if you just kept working at it. I'm such a believer in hard work and thinking that that's what we need to do as citizens right now is hard, hard work to change the system. If I may just add something though, that it's not just hard work that my guys did, and I don't mean to call them my guys, it's just that I've lived with them for so long, I wake up with them in the morning, I think about them at night. Um, my only fear has been that in the afterlife there's going to be a panel of all the presidents that I've ever studied, <laughs> and everyone's going to tell me everything I got wrong about them, and the first person to scream out will be Lyndon Johnson, of yes. course. <laughs> How come those other books were twice as long as the books you wrote about me? But the thing that they shared in common besides hard work is they knew it was important to find time to relax and replenish their energies. We don't think we can do that today. We're so busy. We have our iPhones with us. We have our emails, especially the younger generation. They never take the time to just get away and think. I mean, as I said, when Lincoln went to the theater, it was 100 times he said he could relax when he was there. He relaxed with his funny stories. His sense of humor was his way of whistling off sadness. So in the middle of terrible cabinet meetings, he would tell a funny story. Teddy Roosevelt was able to exercise two hours every afternoon. He somehow found time in the middle of the presidency to play, which is really important. Play allows imagination. It allows you to think creatively. So he would have a boxing match or a wrestling match, or he loved to go to Rock Creek Park where there was a wooded cliff, and he made a rule that you had to go, you couldn't go around any obstacle. So if you came to a rock, you had to climb it. If you came to a precipice, you had to go down it. So these people are falling by the wayside trying to find him. But the best story was told by the French ambassador. He came in his silk outfit. We're going to walk in the Champs Elysees. He's hating every minute of this horrible climb. They finally come to a stream. He says, Thank God it's over, and we'll go back to the White House. 
judge of my horror, he said, when I saw the president unbutton his clothes. And I heard him say, it's an obstacle, we can't go around it, so no sense in getting our clothes wet. So I too, for the honor of France, took off my apparel. <laughs> However, I left on my lavender kid gloves. To be without gloves would be most embarrassing if we should meet ladies on the other side. <laughs> and then, FDR every night had a cocktail party in the middle of World War II, and he made a rule you couldn't talk about the war. You could talk about books, you could talk about movies, gossip, as long as the war didn't get mentioned. And after a while, this cocktail party was so important to him, he wanted the people to be living in the White House to be ready for the cocktail party. So Harry Hopkins, his foreign policy advisor, came for dinner one night, never left until the war came to an end. His secretary, Missy Lahand, lived with the family on the second floor. Winston Churchill came and spent weeks at a time in a room diagonally across from Roosevelt's. Princess Martha from Norway was there. Lorena Hickok, Eleanor's friend, was there. And so I kept imagining, oh my God, all these people in their bathrobes at night and in this corridor that surrounds the second floor suites and wishing when I'd been up there with LBJ when I was 24 that I thought of asking, where did Churchill stay? Where was Roosevelt? Where was Eleanor? But I wasn't thinking in those terms then. So I happened to mention this on a radio program in Washington and it happened that Hillary Clinton was listening then in the White House. So she invited me to a sleepover in the White House and we could figure out where everyone had slept 50 years earlier. <laughs> So two weeks later, she followed up with an invitation to a state dinner, after which between midnight and 2 a.m., President and Mrs. Clinton, my husband and I went through every room and figured out, yes, Chelsea Clinton is sleeping where Harry Hopkins was, the Clintons are <laughs> sleeping where FDR was. We were given Winston Churchill's bedroom. There was no way I could sleep. I was certain he was sitting in the corner drinking his brandy and smoking his cigar. <laughs> But the important point is that they all found ways to replenish their energy under those terrible anxieties and pressures. Only Lyndon Johnson never could do that. And again, that meant that his energy got eaten up and he wasn't able to think as clearly or think as creatively as the other ones could. Well, speaking of work, there's a question about you and your work habits and how long it takes you to write and research a book. Much too long, I suspect. <laughs> I mean, it took me longer to write about World War II than it took the war to be fought. It took me twice as long to write about the Lincoln cabinet than it took the Civil War to be fought. It's partly because I just love the learning of catapulting myself back into another era. And because the only president I knew was LBJ, and I wanted to, just from your earlier question, I wanted to try and recreate this people with that same intimacy. It means reading all the letters that everybody surrounding them wrote. I love reading letters. There's nothing better than a handwritten letter. You feel like you're looking over the shoulder at the person and you're hearing what they felt in, intimately, not just the gossip of the day or diaries that they all kept in those days. I don't know what it'll be like for historians 200 years from now. They'll know so much more about how we walked and talked when we were working on the movie, nobody had ever heard um, Abraham Lincoln speak, but somebody said he spoke in a high voice, and that's how Daniel Day-Lewis then spoke. We knew he walked like a laborer coming home from the hard day, not because we saw him in a video, but because somebody described that that's the way he talked, that's the way he walked. So that it takes such a long period of time, it's the research that I love, to get those intimate details that hopefully make these people come to life. And then the real goal is that people will follow them enough so that when they do die, as you mentioned at the end of this book, they all die. I got sad again when they had to die. Um, and I didn't really want them to die after living with them for so long. But that's what takes a long period of time. And maybe in somebody else's hands it could be quicker, but for me it's a very, very slow process. I mean, as you said, you, you have been close to presidents in a way that many of us won't ever be. Um, LBJ, President Obama, you did one of his exit interviews with him. But I'm curious about, I mean, I've heard you talk about how you came into the Johnson administration that you'd written, he found, you know, you wrote the article how to get rid of LBJ, essentially. You were anti, you were anti the Vietnam War. Given his record on the war, which is really what besmirches and kind of overshadows all that he actually did accomplish on the domestic front, why did you stay with him? Why did you want to be with him? Why did you continue to be with him? Why did you want to write his memoir? Well, I think what happened is when I was first chosen as a White House Fellow, even though the people in the White House Fellows Program knew I'd been involved against the war, they themselves thought it was important for him to be surrounded by other people who were still, there wasn't a clear sense of where the war was fully going then. But I so believed in the, in the domestic programs that I think I rationalized to myself, and probably it may have been just ambition as a young person, that I knew it was an extraordinary experience to be around a president. 
And I remember, weirdly, now that it's the 50th anniversary of 1968, I was a fellow in 67 and 68, and I came to the convention here not in anything to do with him. I was working for him at the time, but just with some friends, and all my friends were anti-war. And I began to question the very thing he was saying, why am I staying there? What am I doing? And I, I made a pledge to my friends. I said, if he calls me up and he asks me to do anything for him, I'm going to quit. This will be my big moment. So I did get a call while we're all in the room, and it's, they said, the president's calling. And he said, I have a favor to ask you, Doris. And I thought, here it comes. And he said, last week when you were at the ranch, you borrowed my flashlight, and I can't find it. Where is it? It was so <laughs> embarrassing. But then at any rate, I said to him, well, how are you? And then he just said to me, how do you think I feel? I can't even come to the convention. They hate me there. This is my party. This is my life. And suddenly, some empathy I felt for him, which I felt in the writing of the memoirs. I only worked on the chapters, luckily, on civil rights and the Congress. And I was able to somehow balance that the epic failure of leadership in Vietnam was balanced by an epic success of leadership on the domestic programs. And they've created the foundation of our modern life. I mean, think of what we'd be like without desegregation, without the Voting Rights Act, without fair housing, without Medicare, without Medicaid. So somehow you balance these things. And in his case, even though the others had flaws, his flaws cut his presidency in two. And I understood it then. I understood it when I wrote it. But I still came away feeling that it was um, that he was an extraordinary leader at some level with a huge, huge problem. The other thing that he did was remarkable that I think many of us are thinking about right now, if we have a system or people in power who seem um, to have a very antagonistic relationship to the very idea of government is that he kind of professionalized the civil service, right? He really built it up. Um, how do we, if, if we are to, if people feel we have to move beyond or, or get through this, the people who feel that, how do we support or recognize the people who are kind of in the trenches, so to speak, working in all these different government departments, even as they're being transformed around them? How do we, elevate them into the spotlight? Or do we? Do we just? No, I, I think it's so important to value public servants. I mean, when you think about, and th there's probably mixed motives of the people who are there. I mean, might we say sh some more of them, should they resign or should they leave? And yet some of them, I'm sure, feel they're at least helping in the departments, for example, perhaps in agriculture or justice to make things not as bad as they might be. And I think we have to respect those individual decisions that are made. My husband was the main speechwriter for, 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 for LBJ. He worked as a young speechwriter for JFK. And his proudest moments were working on all the speeches for LBJ that had to do with civil rights and the Great Society. But at a certain point, he made the decision to leave the White House. He could see the war was eating up all the domestic programs that he cared about. And it was a difficult decision to make, especially when his fellow White House staff people said, you know, Dick Goodwin, he said, you're, you're ruining your career. And then at least when you go home, don't say anything. You know, and then he started speaking out against the war. And he was considered a traitor for turning against the administration. And yet he said, the loyalty is to my country, not to my president, even though my president gave me, as he said, the best possibility of feeling fulfilling my own goals as I could possibly have had to be in the middle of that glorious, glorious time. And he had a more difficult time with LBJ all of his life. But the interesting thing is my husband just died this last spring, and we talked so much about LBJ. And I was perhaps more empathetic because of my experience of watching him at the end of his life when he was so sad that I saw that he was absorbing the sadness as well as the country, of course. And finally, in the end, my husband was writing a, a book that hopefully I'm going to finish about his love affair with America and the ideals of the country. And he realized how close we came to those ideals during the Great Society and began to feel differently about LBJ than he had felt. But the most important part of what he was writing, which still is so important for us today, he was older than I am. He was 86 when he died. So he said, I've lived through the Depression. He had lived through World War II. Um, he had been with Kennedy, and Kennedy died. He was with LBJ, and he saw the war eat things up. He was a great friend of Bobby Kennedy's, who worked on Bobby's campaign, was with Bobby when he died. He'd seen all these terrible moments in American history, and yet he'd seen us come through. And in the end, he said, we've had these ups and downs, but in the end, America is not as fragile as we think. That was one of the last lines he wrote, and I believe that so much still today.
that <laughs> you set me up perfectly for a question I want to ask because I think throughout the book you say that these four men, these four presidents, really, they, you, we can understand them as they were pondering so seriously the question, what does it mean to be an American? You know, it's the guiding question for their presidencies, the greater purpose of their presidencies. And I wonder, is this still a presidential ideal? And is it still an American one? Well, it sure better be if we get a leader that's truly a leader. I mean, that's one of the biggest questions is what does America stand for? You know, one of the things that Lincoln wrote when he was 29 years old, it's a very chilling speech. It's called the Lyceum speech. And he was worried then that there was a lot of anxiety in the land. There were killings. The rule of law was not being followed. There were abolitionist editors who were being murdered. There were lynchings in the South. And he said, in times of this great, this great anxiety, when mobs seem to be ruling, there's a fear that somebody will arise who will want to tear the country down rather than build it up. There might be a dictator coming in our midst. And the answer to it, he said, is education number one. We have to educate the citizens into what the values of this country are, what the purpose of being an American is. And we have to remind people every night when they go to bed, because the scenes of the revolution were fading, he said, and mothers should be reading about the revolution and what America stood for in the first place, what we are, a nation of nations, especially with this terrible battle that's going on with immigration right now. It was Johnson who passed immigration reform that brought all the people in that are now being tried to be not staying here or, or let out. And, and he said that um, they should be reading the, the, the ideals of the revolution to the kids there, as you would read the Bible. So I think there's something to be said about, it seems like a soft idea, but civic education has to be restored, which was once an important part of all of our learning. There's a sense of recommitting ourselves to the ideals of the country and remembering and asking ourselves now, what kind of a country do we want to be? Do we really want to be a country that separates kids at the border? Do we really want to be a country where a president can say he's going to end birthright citizenship even though he has no power to do that as an executive order? Do we really want to be a country where when people send bombs to a, a president and two presidents' families and the president doesn't even call them up to see how are you doing in your families? I mean, this isn't right what's going on right now. And I, I, I hate not going to history, so I'll just simply say, rather than being a pundit on this or a partisan, that when you look at what leadership is and the qualities that these people did at their best, not always, but at their best represent, you know, humility and empathy and resilience and, and, and the ability to communicate and have their word be trusted and the ability to control their impulses and to care about being the president of all the people even though they failed at sometimes doing that and look at the leadership, I'm not even sure that we've got a leader, much less a president in the presidency. And that's the most important thing for us to look at now is who we vote for has to become a leader. Before Tim Russert died, he and I talked about the fact that journalists weren't covering the elections because now that we have primaries, we the people decide who the person should be rather than the parties. Parties may have chosen badly at times, but at least they tried to choose somebody who would sue the various factions in the party at the convention. Now the primaries choose it. And how do we choose our leaders? Somebody who in a debate says something interesting and zings somebody else. Somebody who raises the most money. So we talked about creating like a leadership index that we should look at all the candidates who are running. They've all come from somewhere. They've been leaders somewhere. And we could look at whether they had these kinds of traits, whether they built a team and the team had purpose, whether they had ambition for others than themselves. And, and not just have it be a magazine article in depth, but the way we talk about our elections. And I think if maybe this whole experience can make us look at what do we want as a leader, who are we as a people, it's really a philosophic moment for this country, then we can indeed learn from this. Just like they learned from all the problems they had, we have to learn from the problem we're having as citizens. So that was a beautiful ending, but if you'll indulge me, I have one more question for sure. you. Um, so you know how we talk about certain female leaders, um, RBG, HRC. So around the office, we've been kind of fangirling and fanboying around you and calling you DKG. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would be proud to be DKG, uh -huh. absolutely proud. Yeah. <laughs> what is your leadership style? How do you think of yourself as a leader? 
I don't know. You know, it's interesting. When I was trying to think about the people that I was writing about, and, and I'm on such a smaller scale as a leader, um, but I've had the person who's worked for me now and is my main assistant for 18 years. The person who's been my research assistant has been there for 35 or 40 years. And I'd like to believe it's because we've worked together as a team and that I've been able to understand them. We, we've, I've given them a sense of participation in what we're doing together, that thrill of working together and seeing that finished product. And I guess what I'd really hope to believe is that what historians have a chance to do is to make people understand where our history comes from, to educate people, to feel, I love history so much, I just wish everybody had a passion for it. I wish every teacher loved history. And I think the most important thing I'd like to think I can do as a leader is to talk about history, to talk about the importance of education. I still think that's the key to our changing system, that without mobility, without people having the chance through the educational system, as Lincoln said, to rise to the level of their talents and their discipline, it's not fair. It's not what America was meant to be. And then we've got huge problems with teachers not being paid what they should be, huge problems with the education system that has to be made better. And if I can, through history, just make people understand how much these other people valued education and how much they valued talking to citizens and making people understand problems. Um, it's a small role to play, but I, I can't imagine doing anything else other than this love of history that has been with me from childhood. I guess partly from, as I said, my father's love of history, partly because my mother had had rheumatic fever as a child, so it left her with a damaged heart and a series of small heart attacks when I was young. And though she had only an eighth grade education, she read books in every spare moment she could find. But the only thing I loved more than her reading a book to me was listening to stories about her girlhood. I somehow became obsessed with the idea that if I could keep her talking about the days when she was young and healthy, that her mind would control her body and this premature aging process would be stopped in its tracks. So I was constantly telling her, Mom, tell me stories about you when you were my age, not realizing how peculiar that was until I had my own three sons who never once have said to me, Mom, tell me a story about you when you're my age. But somehow I think that love of storytelling, the love of history that my father engendered in me because of baseball has made me realize that through history, um, even though my mother died when I was 15, my father when I was in my 20s, that they still live on in my mind as these presidents live on in my mind. And I guess that feeling of passion for history, which allows me to believe that the private people we've loved and lost in our families and the public figures we've respected in history really can live on so long as we, tell, we pledge to tell and to retell the stories of their lives. So that's what my goal is, to just tell these stories and through them we bring back the people we cared about who are no longer are alive, we bring back the presidents who can inspire us and make us act in ways that we want to act. And if I can do that in a small way, that will make me feel happy. Well, you have. Thank you. Doris Kearns, good one. DKG, thank you so much.